Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm Lori LeBay, the host and founder of Alzheimer Speaks. And before we get started with our show, we always have new listeners, so I just like to kind of tell people a little bit about us. Um, bottom line, Alzheimer Speaks is an advocacy-based company providing multiple platforms to shift our dementia care culture from crisis to comfort. And I started this just due to my own journey with my own mother of 30 years. I just felt like we weren't connected enough and we didn't have enough resources. Um, we truly believe here at Alzheimer Speaks that by joining forces and sharing knowledge and just having these everyday uh, common conversations about life with dementia that we can remove the stigmas attached to memory loss and help those diagnosed with the disease and those help, helping care for them continue to live with purpose. And, and together we can get a true understanding of, of what the needs are so that we can move forward as a society and as a world. At our core, we believe collaboration is really the only way we're going to win this battle against dementia. And I know that that's working. And the reason I know that is because all of your likes, clicks, and shares uh, got Alzheimer's Speaks named the number one influencer online, according to Share Care and Dr. Oz. And we did not do that. You guys did that. Um, so I would just encourage you to continue to like um, the information that we push out. So when you're listening to the radio show, go ahead and click on that and share it with your Facebook friends, your Twitter tribes, your Pinterest people, your LinkedIn colleagues. All of that knowledge is power. The more we can get that out to our sphere of influence, um, the easier it is for them to grab. And, you know, a lot of times people just aren't ready for the information. But when they keep seeing different information popping up all the time, it kind of eases the process and makes it more normal than not. And um, so, again, I want to thank you uh, for assisting with that. I also want to let you know if you're listening, uh, hey, maybe you should be our next guest. Uh, we we let everyone's voice be heard here on Alzheimer's Speaks. Um, we think, again, we're a team, and so we want to hear from those who are diagnosed, uh, family members who are caring for a loved one or a friend, um, maybe you're a business professional who has um, some type of service product or tool. Maybe you've written a book. Maybe you're a film producer like we have today or a researcher. Um, you know, reach out to me. You can go to alzheimerspeaks.com, and there's a big contact button um, in the header. Just click on that, and you can call me or email me, uh, tweet me, um, and let's have a conversation, and let's let your voice be heard as well. Now, before I introduce our guest today, I do just have a couple of free trials for you um, that you can take advantage of. One is for FreshBooks, um, which is an accounting system. If you're like me and on the move, you need to get organized. Um, you can uh, try their system out for a 30-day free trial by going to Fresh or go. Uh, the URL is gofreshbooks.com forward slash alive. That's gofreshbooks.com forward slash alive. The other offer is with um, Audible Books, and you can um, get a 30-day trial there to download a free book. Uh, we're always on the run these days, and so sometimes it's nice if you're maybe you are a walker or a runner or just drive a lot or um, your eyes aren't what they used to be, you can uh, listen to an Audible book. And in order to take advantage of that free trial, all you have to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash social. That's audibletrial.com forward slash social. So let's talk about, uh, you know, today's show. Um, this is going to be an interesting one. I was lucky enough to meet the lead producer of the film uh, that's going to be rolling out here called Will I Be Next? And I was so impressed with this film. We kind of got a preliminary um, partial screening in our uh, Roseville Alzheimer's and Dementia group in Minnesota. And it just has such a nice balance in it. And we're going to be talking about that with Teresa, uh, or Teresa Barry Tanner. Uh, who is the lead uh, producer of this film. Again, the name of it is Will I Be Next? And um, <clears throat> this film is not only her brainchild, but her passion. And when I've spoken to her, when I was able to meet her in person, um, that just really comes out. You see, she lost her mom to dementia in 2008, and she began um, this project a couple of years later. 
in an effort to just promote a greater awareness of the disease and to help reduce stigmas. And filmmaking is a new skill to Therese, um, but she has learned through volunteering and putting in considerable time on this project. Um, her, her real career is really as a project manager in the health insurance industry for over 30 years, but she's really done an amazing job with this film, and I'm going to encourage people to put this on your radar. So welcome, Therese. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you, and thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Well, it was a very fun talking with you on the phone, and I was excited. We had to push our date down quite a ways um, to be able to meet, and uh, it was well worth it, well worth it. Um, and your your energy and your passion for this really shine through, um, no matter you know how how you're communicating. So I appreciate your efforts, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Now, we also have um, Barb Geckner with us, who is in the film, and she was born and raised in Spooner, Wisconsin, and she now lives in uh, Cedarburg, Wisconsin, over by Milwaukee. She has two brothers, a sister, and is married to Rick and has one son and four stepsons, um, and she personally has worked in local government for 29 years, but now she's got a, a nice role in, a, in this this uh, documentary, and we're going to be talking about that and, and her her journey with dementia. So welcome, Barb. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, and thanks for doing this for us. Well, I think, I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm glad both of you were able to be here. I want to start out with each of you kind of telling your story a little bit about um, how you got involved with dementia. And I'm going to start with Therese. If you can just give people a little bit of background about your journey with your mom. Sure. Um, well, my mother was... Um, diagnosed in the spring of 2001 and her initial symptoms were was difficulty completing her sentences um, and it, it that persisted and uh, my father called me um, you know to, to I lived thir about 35 miles away and as we watched that persist we, we just knew that there was something more wrong even though she wasn't exhibiting a lot of other symptoms, it just wasn't normal, um, and it was getting worse. So we, we went to a neurologist um, who did that short memory test, and she answered about only half of those questions correctly, and it, it was such a shock. Um, even though we knew something was wrong, I think when you go in and you hear um, what they th that they think it's Alzheimer's, it's just it's just a shock. Um, and later she had an MRI, which did show that her hippocampus was, was very, you know, was much smaller than the average person her age. And that was, you know, at that time, one of the telltale signs. So um, then began the road, um, which many of you are familiar with, um, the long road to learn, to adapt, to find good care, which at the, at, in the beginning, it was my father and, and me and, and my brothers and sisters assisting. And, um, you know, a, as we know, the, the decline and the issues continue and things just, you know, they get worse. She did go on a couple of the drugs, um, but and I can't remember all the names, but it didn't seem like they, they did a whole lot. But, you know, families, when they're at that point, they will, you know, we try, we try anything um, that we think might help and that we, we know or we believe is safe. Yeah. So in this, in this process um, is when I learned about this scientific study um, at, at UW-Madison. So a, probably two years after my mother was diagnosed and our effort to learn more about Alzheimer's, um, my father and I went to a, um, a six-week series at the local hospital about Alzheimer's and dementia to educate ourselves more. And at one of those sessions, Dr. Mark Sager, who is a gerontologist, now retired, was also the principal investigator of a research study at UW-Madison. He talked about he talked about Alzheimer's and all the scientific kind of details. I had to take notes 
and reread them and reread them. But the main point of this is he also mentioned this longitudinal study at UW Madison for people who have a parent with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And we talked to him afterwards and in the next six to eight months, I, I called UW Madison and I signed up for that study. So I've been in that research study now for uh, for over 10 years. So um, as Lori mentioned, um, the full span of my mom's illness was about seven years. She did end up, um, I got a call one uh, day in September, um, was probably September of 2006. And we had really no plan. Um, other than my father taking care of her, which which is, was not a good thing. Um, and he just called me one day and he said, I, I can't do this anymore. That and had to be he, was, devastating. he was cracking. Yeah. And what a difficult call that must have been for him to make um, and, and for you to hear. Um, because I'm sure neither of you planned on, on that ever happening. Exactly. Yeah, <clears throat> well, interesting. Well, let's hear a little bit about Barb's story and um, h how she got involved uh, with this. And Barb, were you personally, um, if you can kind of give your personal history in terms of uh, dementia and how you got involved? Um, my mom had back surgery at age 55 about 20 years ago, and it was after that that we started recognizing symptoms. Um, but it was about five years later that I actually took her to a neurologist who diagnosed the Alzheimer's. Um, and that was a very difficult visit because she cried and said, I don't want to have this disease. Mm -hmm. And I'm standing there thinking there's nothing I can do for her to help her other than to continue to love her and be there for her. Um, and at that time I lived I lived close when she was first diagnosed. I, I moved only about eight years ago. But um, so that was the start of the journey. And, and I had, it was ironic because I had seen a program on PBS about Alzheimer's when it kind of first, in my eyes, became more public. And I had thought at the time, oh my gosh, what a horrible disease for anybody to have to go through. And then my mom was diagnosed a couple of years later. And so that, that was the beginning of what's been a very long journey. And, you know, it, it progressed slowly. But over the, the first five to ten years, I struggled emotionally with all that was going on in our family dynamics and taking care of her and what she was progressing with. And at one point in discussing this with my own doctor, he suggested that I contact Dr. Sager and the RAP study at UW-Madison. Um, he said, you know, if you really want to try to do something, get involved in this research. And so I contacted UW-Madison after looking things up online and, and talking to them about it. And at that time, I lived four hours from Madison. But I began the studies and um, would travel down there as necessary to be involved in the study. And I'm willing to be a guinea pig for anything because I – at the, that time in joining this study, I, I definitely felt this is the only thing that I can try to have an influence on in Alzheimer's. I can love my mom and I can take care of her and I can be there for her every so often because I'm five hours away. But getting involved in research hopefully will help keep my kids and my grandkids from ever having to suffer in the same way that we did in the beginning of our journey, especially. Um, they'll have more information and hopefully our study along with other studies can help not only find a cure, but find the knowledge of how Alzheimer's occur occurs and what we can do to help the caregivers better deal with the patients. Um, you know, I. The journey's been very difficult, as I said, especially once I moved away. I go up every couple weeks to see my mom, and my dad is her main caregiver 24-7. Um, and sometime back, he got frustrated. My two sisters help 
take care of her as well and, and some nieces who go in and check on it. And my dad has been adamant in the past to not allow nursing services to come in and help. And so my sisters were taking the brunt of it. Both have health issues. One's had four kidney transplants. Um, the other one has a number of issues, including rheumatoid arthritis, and they're both physically lifting mom and, and helping bathe her and move her. She's she's bedridden and atrophied. Um, very painful to watch, but we feel we have our own communication with her. But um, my dad refused to allow nursing staff to come in, and finally when my sisters were near exhaustion themselves of working all the time and taking care of her, they you know, insisted that we've got to try to do something. Well, he chose to put her in the nursing home and try that route. And many years ago when my mom worked when I was very young, she worked at that same nursing home. And it's one of your, um, it's a northern community, not near a metropolis. And so it has limited care. It doesn't have the same types of assisted uh, living facilities or memory care units like I have where I'm at. And it was an extremely difficult time for us. Um, even though she had said when she was younger she didn't want her family to take care of her, she wanted to go in the nursing home, she would she would be in there asking us to take her home. She just wanted to go home. And while she didn't have her full faculties, um, she still knew when she needed to use the bathroom and needed help getting up. She couldn't walk on her own at that time. And um, because of the limited care, she became incontinent. And eventually we ended up taking her out of the nursing home. My dad insisted, and we were very reluctant, but we took her out of the nursing home and took her back home. And um, that's really been truly a blessing because you can see the change in her and it's so much easier not dealing with the other issues that we had in that particular location. Um, the nurses worked very hard. They tried to do their best. It's just they were very shorthanded. And so then he also allowed um, nursing assistants to come into the home. And so they've now been having nurses come in uh, two, three times a day along with my sisters and nieces to help. And that has taken a tremendous load off my dad. Um, I think that's one of the hardest things for the caregivers is because they insist on doing it because they love this person. They've vowed to always be with them and always take care of them. But I don't think they realize how stressful it is on their own bodies and their own minds. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of where our journey is at now, just continuing the care and just loving her more and more every day and doing what we can. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for thank you for sharing that. I know what an emotional journey it is. I was on on my own journey with my mom for thirty years, so <clears throat> I totally totally understand that. Um, Therese, can you tell us how did you get started with this project to make this film? Will I be next? Sure. Um, well, a after one of my study visits at UW-Madison, I was talking to one of the study coordinators. It was um, a, a couple of years after my mom passed away. Um, it turned out that the visit right after, six months after my mom passed away, I, I, we do cognitive testing. Um, it takes about two and a half hours. It's pretty, it's pretty intense. Um, everything from, you know, just word recall to um, to number recall to story math story problems in your head to um, to recalling a fairly you know a short story that the the tester tells you, and I had a I had a breakdown in the cognitive test, and you know I recovered well enough to get back in and finish the test, but. It was, a, it was a difficult experience, and I was talking to the research coordinator about that experience. Now it had it's been 18 to two, two years uh, ago at that time, and she told me that many of the participants sometimes experienced, you know, anxiety in the testing for a variety of reasons. Could be a situation like mine or others. 
and a light bulb went on in my head. It just resonated with me that, wow, I'm not, I'm not the only one that goes through this. And everybody in this study, there are um, 1,500, about 1,500 people in this research study, um, including Wisconsin, but representatives from 33 total other states. Everybody has a story. And it just, I just, I couldn't, after that conversation, that thought just kept coming back to me. And as that thought sort of sat in my head, um, I thought about, wouldn't it be interesting to, to tell the story of this disease in a new way through the eyes of somebody in the study? as they go through the study, meaning the research side of it, but also as their role as a person, as a, as a daughter or a son, you know, dealing with a person with Alzheimer's, the caregiving side, the, the, the family side of it, kind of the two prong. And I, I realized that um, that might have, that, that might be, it wasn't only interesting, it might, maybe it's a good idea. So I ran by some family members and they thought it was a good idea, namely my two children um, and my husband. And then I, I talked to the people at the study and they said, well, that's not a, you know, that, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And then I went on this journey to do research to see if there was any other documentary film or book or um, you know, TV show, anything that might have been done that was similar. And through that research process, I found out there really wasn't. And as I did that research process, I also learned a lot of more about the disease kind of in the public sphere. And I, I learned that um, it, it still, at that time, and that was, now we're talking five years ago, you know, it still had a great deal of stigma attached to it. Um, I learned as I did the research that funding was lacking for it in comparison with other diseases. And so as I did the research, it became even more apparent to me that perhaps telling the story in a different way through this research, through the study participant, perhaps... Um, it might be a vehicle to shed light on the disease in a new way, generate more awareness and, and through awareness action. And so the, the fall after I did the research, I, I, you know, put together a little PowerPoint and went and talked to the people in Madison to say I really, you know, wanted to proceed and, and, and um, also then had to find an independent film maker and raise some money and all of that with a, a six page PowerPoint with no branding, but just trying to, trying to go out there and see how I could put this thing together to, to, to give it legs, so to speak, and, and get it off the ground. Oh, that's, a, that's amazing um, what you've done. Now, when do you think you'll be, um, well, I should say, when did you start with the project and when do you think you'll be completed? Because I know you're, you're, you're still working on it. Yes. So, well, we started to, we, um, in terms of, so, so, so I will just step back a minute and say this is an independent documentary. So while we're filming the study um, in Madison, it's not um, sponsored by or funded by UW Madison or the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Institute. It's it's an independent documentary that, you know, think of it as providing Barb and her two other participants who are in the film, kind of providing a, a window into the disease in a different way than maybe we've seen it before. Um, so we started filming um, about three years ago. Um, we have what, Lori, what you saw is our preview clip. It's, it's a 23-minute, this is what the film's about kind of clip with some, you know, pretty good detail. But we'll be doing some um, additional film shooting yet this year and into the first half of next year. Um, and then we've already worked on editing. There will be, um, you know, more editing to do. And the edit process now going forward 
is to really work all the footage into a rough cut, which would be, you know, a, a semi-finished version of what the final film would look like. It won't be final, but it'll, it'll be our first, you know, film in, in its entirety. And we hope to have a rough cut, um, a beginning of a rough cut later this year and a full rough cut next year. And then, you know, we plan to be able to um, first, first like premiere it um, with any good luck at one of the major film festivals in the early months of 2018. I always have to kind of slow myself down, make sure I'm getting the right year. But yes, the first few months of, of 2018. And, you know, we'll look, we're, we'll be working, uh, my director and my co-producer and um, the other members of our team to build a distribution plan um, as well as an outreach and community engagement plan, which we've already started and gained a lot of ground in. But um, after the film festival uh, circuit, we hope to, um, you know, one of our goals is to get it on one of the national public television series like Independent Lens or Point of View, um, and that will be later down the line, and then we'll submit it to other outlets, et cetera. So that. You know, there's a lot of detail that goes in all that, but that's kind of the overarching timeline of where we're at and where we hope to be. And we still have to raise money to finish the film. So we're in the throes of writing grants and trying to get some, get the rest of our, um, get the rest of the funds we need to, to actually complete it. So lots going on. Okay. So in terms of, of audience for the film, who was your target? So I'm just thinking if we've got... Uh, listeners that might want to contact you to see if they can, you know, have this for a conference or do a screening or however you're, however you're going to work it, if they're going to be able to buy DVDs and maybe you haven't gotten that far in terms of, of thought process. Um, but um, who, who would be your ideal target for this film? Well, I think initially we were thinking kind of generally you know, the baby boom generation is going to be in, hit pretty hard and their families. So we're talking about the baby boomers, their children and grandchildren. So that's sort of a general audience. But we were able to present the 23-minute clip at the um, Wisconsin State Alzheimer's Conference. And um, we do think from the feedback we got there from social workers, from um people who work in assisted living, uh, from a wide variety of, of, of uh, I was able to show it last week to, you know, John and Susan McFadden, who are very involved in the Dementia Friendly Community Initiative, um, that, you know, there's, there's so many potential um, outside of the general audiences that I mentioned places and arenas that it might be able to be, you know, screened and used for either educational or discussion purposes. Um, so there, that, that piece of it will evolve through our community engagement planning, where we'll work with all those kinds of entities through conferences, et cetera, to make it available for use for, you know, for professionals who are in the field, mm -hmm. whether they be, like I mentioned before, um, you know, social workers or others, you know, there's, there's a wide variety of people um, and, and institutions that, you know, see, see the benefit of it to them. So we have a lot of work to do there, but that gives you a snapshot of some of our thoughts. Okay. I know in uh, working with the film, His Neighbor Phil, uh, we've just had a ton of requests. People want it on DVD or to be able to access it online and it, it, we're just not in that mode um, for this particular film at this time. You know, we're still doing more screenings, and um, they, too, are trying to get it to, you know, one of the larger uh, TV um, stations to be able to broadcast and things. So it's an interesting process. I knew nothing at all about it, and a very complicated <laughs> process as well. Um, but I... You know, after previewing yours, I, I think you're going to have the same issue where people are there. They just want access to it. Um, it's got such a nice balance of, of real life and research and 
then that healthcare connection as well. So um, you've really done a, a very, very nice blend um, with the film. So I, I just uh, I can't say enough about that. Um, I'm going to throw a couple of questions at Barb here, if you don't mind. And um, uh, Barb, I, I w- yep. I'm wondering with you and your family, because uh, this is a question I know I get asked, and, and Trace, you probably do as well. Um, do you and your siblings have concerns about developing Alzheimer's or a form of dementia because of your mom's diagnosis? Um, I definitely do. And I know that it crosses the minds of my four brothers and sisters. Um, One sister who's had all the kidney transplants is sure she's not going to get it because she's got her dad's genes or our dad's genes. And (laughs) so she's like, I've had enough in my life. I won't be getting it. Um, I have a highly stressful job and I forget a lot and mix up words and get confused at times. And I, I know it's more when I'm more stressed and when I'm more tired. Um, my brothers will talk about forgetting things and my other sister and, and we kind of compare notes as to, okay, how are you feeling about this? Is it, do you think it's normal? Do you think, you know, we need to do other types of testing and, we all really kind of come down to it being forgetful and stumbling with words is we just pray that it's just normal aging. And I, you know, one thing being involved in the study, I tell myself you're in the best hands there are if and when you develop it, you're going to find out early. Um, You know where to go. You've got loads of information on people who deal with this and the research they're doing. And so I read a lot of different books about brain activity and and different types of diseases and things with the brain. Um, I don't have any doctor background and I don't understand a lot of it, but I find it very interesting and intriguing. But I sometimes I stress more than others about getting it, especially when I see my mom. Um, It makes it much harder for me to imagine it because I imagine her life without it. And we lost her not just as a mom, but as a friend, years ago, I had dreams of all the things that I could do with her, and they're not even possible, holding conversations, going shopping, any of it. Um, But I can still love her. She's still there, and I wouldn't trade that for the world. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I I think it's really common for people to to fear um, the disease once it's hit their family. And, you know, the, the demographics still aren't really clear because, again, we don't have enough research backing this. And that's why the studies you guys are in is so critically important. I, I know we've got one here in Minnesota called the, the Minnesota Memory Project. And um, we need to volunteer and to be part of this so, they, so the researchers can have a better idea of, you know, is this something that's coming down the pike, what does it look like, and all of those types of things. Because the fear of thinking about that um, can scare the bejesus out of some people and um, really toss them into depression. And we all know with the disease, stress stress just ups the ante for symptoms. Right. And so we don't want to add to that. Therese, how about you? Do you you worry about um, possibly getting um, dementia yourself? Well, this is an interesting question for me, um, Lori. And by the way, I want to thank you for your just your your accolades. I do so much appreciate your your um, your enthusiasm for this, and I I just want to mention that that's very meaningful. Um, I I will say that when I started this project, I didn't really have a lot of fear, um, even though I knew that the scientists had said that. You know, people with a parent are are at higher risk. I just I'm one of these people that um, kind of lives lives. I, I wouldn't say I quite live in the moment, <laughs> as Barb knows, but I would say that you know I'm I'm a focused person and I live day to day, and I don't think a lot about the future in terms of you know getting old and you know that kind of thing. I've never been that kind of thinker. Um, but it's interesting that doing the film has made me a little more conscious of, of, of that issue, of having a greater chance just because, um, 
you know, hearing Barb and the other two women and, you know, hearing the fears of others. And, and then I learned that one of the, um, we were down in Madison filming the scientists and Sterling Johnson, who's the new principal investigator said he gave us statistics about, you know, what they thought the risk was for a child of a parent with Alzheimer's. And I had thought it was, you know, I don't know. I don't remember exactly what I thought it was, but it's three times the regular risk. And when he told, and I said, so what does that mean? Um, it takes it from about 12 to 15% and ups it into the, you know, high 30 to 40%. Now that, that made me think a little bit differently. <laughs> that grabs um, your attention, so yeah. I think I'm more aware of, I'm more aware of some things that I wasn't aware of because now this, this ish, this, even though my mom is gone for quite a few years now, you know, this issue is a bigger part of my life. And I'm glad that it is because um, because I really believe that through the film we can we can um, we can maybe have an impact on, on some of some of the things with respect to the disease and, and that's where we're headed. But I think I have uh, probably become a little bit more fearful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, it's just they really don't know. I mean, you talk to different doctors, or I do, and and researchers, and and you get different numbers um, regarding this depending on how they're how they're interpreting the figures. And and yet, when I talk with family members, you know, so many of them say it runs in our family. I have no doubt, you know. And they will, you know, they will talk about all the different relatives that have it. And yet that information isn't with the researchers. And, and then you have other families where, you know, it's just kind of the odd duck. You know, everyone else is fine. And so it's, it's hard to say, um, you know, where all of this is going to, where it's all going to fall and, you know, what really is the cause of it and um, to how much control do we have over it. And I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, what we believe um, and what we think um, has a big impact on our lives. And I know other people will disagree with that, but, you know, that's my personal philosophy. So I really try hard not to think about it because I don't have any control over it, you know, other than to try to push it away and, um, and keep myself busy and active. And, and out of all the things I've seen, and all the people I've talked to around the world, you know, just through through my job, um, one of the biggest things that seems to kind of keep it at bay is keeping active and keeping engaged and being purposeful. So that's kind of where I'm trying to direct my energy more so than, oh, gosh, I forgot that. Is that really an issue? And kind of going down the rabbit hole, which is really easy to do some days, you know, <laughs> especially when you're just not having a good day. You just want to jump down that hole and and kind of spin, but I know it's not a, for me, it's not a good place to go. Um, and, um, you know, and get all that, that self doubt, you know, swirling around me. Um, Barb, I wanted to ask you about, you know, being involved in the film. Um, how did it impact you and how do you think it's going to help others that care? Um, I just want to touch base on what you had said before asking that question. Mm -hmm. I am a firm believer in how you think affecting you. (laughs) So I'm one of those that jumps in the rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. Um, The film itself uh, has been an incredible experience to be involved in and to meet the people we have and to understand what goes into not just the filmmaking, but the whole process that Therese has been through with the film. I think, you know, if for me, it's I've met other people with similar experiences to mine. So knowing I'm not alone in the journey helps make me feel better. I share this experience with others. And no matter how different each of our situations is, there's understanding from those who've been through it and knowing the difficulties. And we can share tips and ideas of what has worked, what hasn't worked. I think for, you know, when the film comes out and others watch it, they too will gain that understanding and realizing, you know, if they've had no experience with it, how difficult it can be. And, but yet also realizing how much love 
the person still gets and how much love the caregivers have to give. And no matter that difficulty, it's it's still their loved one that they're dealing with. And giving that time is, I don't know, I don't know the right word I want there, but it's, it's so critical in also helping us get through the journey from our end. And I just, I think other people too will see through the research part in the film and other things the rest of us have to say as to what other organizations are out there, what things we can, where we can go to, to learn more and to share with others again, the knowledge of what we've learned and to realize that research is so critical for all of us to learn about many things in our humanity and our lives that can help us further in the future. And, you know, I just hope it also helps people get more involved with not only the research, but volunteering, caregiving, um, being as friendly to people who look lost in this world as you would be to those who don't look lost. Um, they'll just, they'll see such a great variety of things that I, I think, all three of our families have gone through and it'll help give better understanding and those light bulbs will go off that say aha mm -hmm. I've been there too how did how did your family Barb deal with you deciding to be in the film what were did was there sometimes family will have pushback on well you know this is a private matter and and other times they're like go get them you know <laughs> what was your family's reaction it's It's been interesting because um, our dad is pretty stubborn mm -hmm. and to some extent fairly private. I wasn't really sure how he was going to take it. Um, we have interesting family dynamics as, you know, I, I say we're the dysfunctional family from where we're at, but pretty much every family has some dysfunctionality. And I was concerned about that getting in the way of things, but I did, you know, I, I, talked to my sisters first about it and my my one sister had said early on I think we should try to do this and so I took the move a few months later when I knew that Therese was looking for families and you know looking through them to determine what would work and so I sent her the email and and described our situation and everything to it and then you know when she came back sometime later and said yes we we really want to involve your family and you know so we need to talk more I just made sure my sisters were on board and I um, I ran it past my dad I don't know if at the time he really realized what we were getting him into um, but as Therese can attest he's he's reluctant but he likes talking to to nice girls and cute girls and so <laughs> Therese and Melissa fit that bill and uh, so he, he, like I say, he's reluctant each time they go to talk to him, but pretty soon he relaxes and he opens up to them and they're able to film him and they're able to get him to do things that us girls could never get him to do. Uh -huh. So it, um, they've, they've been accepting of it and I think they're all very excited as to how it's going to turn out and to know that we're involved. And one thing it gives me is I'll always have my mom on film. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll be able to see us there with her at all times once she's gone, and that's tremendous for me. Mm -hmm. And it's it it was just amazing to me when I watched the clips when they created the website, and I thought I have I have not met the other two people, but to see them and and see that they're tangible and that they've gone through this as well, it's um it's just been an amazing journey. But my my family. Um, the brothers haven't been involved in it at all, and, and they have a great deal of difficulty with the disease with our mom. But um, I think the rest of us are, we're all very glad to be doing it. Okay. Yeah, um, Lori, can mm -hmm. I mention just sure. a quick interjection? The style we're using in the film is to follow the families over a three-year period in their everyday lives with some interviews, but it's really not interview based. I mean, I know you saw it, but this mm -hmm. is for, you know, the listeners. So it tries to, um, this, this style is, you know, tries to tell the stories of the lives of, of Barb and her two colleagues in the film, you know, as it's unfolding and make it, you know, it's really their lives and what's going on. It's not a, 
uh, preset, we come in and just interview them after the fact of things. So hopefully that will um, be of, you know, seeing, you know, getting a glimpse into the lives of people who are, you know, participating in research and have had various experience with caregiving, you know, will, will be something that resonates with, with other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's done really um, nice. Uh, You're kind of a mouse in the corner seeing, uh, seeing how families are dealing with things. And, and then, you know, when you're talking with the medical professionals and the researchers, it's kind of a combination of being able to see them in process and how they handle things and, um, and then conversation as well. But it's just, it's, it's just done so well. It, it, the, the bedside manner on all people's parts is just so authentic, I guess, is the best word um, that I can find for it. And um, wow. it, it just flows very, very nicely. It's, uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen a piece um, with these elements together done this well. And, um, well, thank you. And our, our, our whole group pretty much felt that way you know, when we were able to, to preview it. And we can't wait to get our, our, our uh, grubby little claws on it to be able to share it with our communities, <laughs> you know, when it's time. Because, um, you know, 2018 sounds like a long ways out there for, but it, you know, when you've got so many people now interested in wanting to get stuff out, you know, I, I'm on the other side of the cor- coin now from when I was promoting what you know his neighbor Phil and you know was one of the sponsors people had to go through me and I couldn't understand why people were upset they couldn't have it now I can because now I, now I want your film you know and I want to be able to get it out there um, but it's not it's not ready yet and you're you're still in the process and, and it's just this journey so I'm, I'm hoping that you know this is such a great median uh, for people to get involved with and I, I hope more um, people will start donating and really getting involved because it's, it's you know it's it's so easy to sit back and watch you know and and yet really feel what's going on and and that's so important. Um, let's see. Oh, I can't believe our time is just flying by here uh, so quickly. I told you I'd go fast. <laughs> you did. Um, so I, I want to um, ask Teresa, I want to make sure that we get this question in. What are your goals for the film? Did you have any or did you just think this is a good idea? Let's go for it and we'll see how it plays out. Well, that's how it was in the beginning. But I've, I've learned that, you know, documentary films um, are, are different than your, you know, regular feature film blockbusters that have big advertising budgets. And documentary films are about, you know, trying to stimulate change of some sort. So as we've worked as a team, um, we're, our outreach and community engagement campaign, which means, you know, what venues can we do screenings where people can really use this material? I mentioned some of those before. It may be, you know, it may be a dementia-friendly community like Roseville. It may be a group of, uh, I think uh, Susan McFadden said, you know, gerontologist she wants to show it in her classroom i mean there's so many avenues so we're we're working to develop a big list of of entities that want to partner with us for our engagement but in the meantime we are thinking of these four broad goals that um we hope the film will produce changes in attitude and behavior that accelerates the discovery of a cure Meaning, I mean, I don't think at the beginning I thought the film could really be a catalyst to get people more involved in research, but now I see that it maybe could. And we know that clinical trial participation is so important and there's not enough people signing up. So maybe, maybe, you know, that sounds like a pretty good avenue. You, You mentioned being engaged and active. Well, you know, some of the study results of the study in Madison and others are showing that you know, lifestyle habits and, and, and exercise, um, there are things we can do to, pro- you know, there probably are, there's a high probability that how we take care of ourselves um, is, is, can link to staving off the disease, even if we will eventually get it or maybe not get it at all. So physical activity and the culture of brain health, we want to activate that kind of culture. Um, and, and very importantly, we really want to advocate 
um, we want to produce changes in attitude and behavior that advocates practices of, of dignity towards those living with dementia. We really need to reduce that stigma um, and, and help, help there because it's still there. It's still there. And then finally, you know, really acknowledging this Alzheimer's impact across generations lessening stigma, with, with, which, which I mentioned, but we need more open diagnosis and treatment and catching, this, it, catching it if it is going to happen early. And then communities supporting individuals mm -hmm. um, like the Dementia Friendly Community Initiative. So there's just a host now that we believe the film can help stimulate and promote in terms of the culture we need to have around solving this disease and supporting people that have it. Oh, wonderful. Well, I, I thank you both for being with us today. It's just been uh, such a pleasure. And we'll have to have you back again when you're ready to, to launch um, so that we can remind people once again about this brilliant film called Will I Be Next? Um, keep, it, keep it on your radar. Um, on our uh, homepage, you will find uh, both... Uh, Therese and Barb's contact information there, so feel free to, to reach out to them. I also pointed them to the film so that they could see some clips to the website and um, that's being promoted as well. So, because it, it's just it's, it, it's just such a great piece. So that might be something you might even want to save on your computer and just, just load it and um and check back and and keep watching and and keep your ears and eyes open for alzheimer speaks too because we will definitely let you know when that is out and if you're in wisconsin um, check out the wisconsin registry for alzheimer's patients uh, for the study there um, your own state may have a study as well and uh, i'm not sure if they take people from out of state or not i believe the minnesota memory project does so my guess is they may as well do you guys know well, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, they really need that the big push for participation is more in the African American and Hispanic communities. So they need more people um, of color to sign up for the study. And I think they, people who live out of state can definitely con consider it. I don't know how much they do in the way, you know, of, of compensation for out of state travel. But um, as you mentioned, you know, there are studies in other cities, in other states. There's the uh, trial match for clinical trials with the Alzheimer's Association. There's many, you know, other studies that people outside of the state of Wisconsin could consider, you know, lending a hand to, lending their brain to, <laughs> lending their time to. Wonderful. Well, I thank you ladies so much for, for being with us. Um, Barb, any last comments from you? Um, I would just mention that I have been involved in, in studies in Minnesota at, at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, so that, that state does accept others, so I, I would assume ours does too. Um, just want to encourage people with the person that you're giving care to, keep them active, keep them involved, let them know others are out there and, and do the same for yourself. They, they need to know that they're still useful no matter what it takes. Don't park them in a corner and, and pretend that they're not there and it's not happening. There's lots of opportunities and organizations out there to help you both and will do tremendous for your stress and the, the person you're caring for to help them get through this better. Okay. Well, thank you, ladies. And again, for our audience, keep your eyes peeled for Will I Be Next, the documentary. Thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank uh, you for oh, having us. Lori, Great. thank you a thousand times over. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome. Um, for those of you that are new to the Alive and Social Network, you might want to check out Apples to Apples on Sunday night with Scott and Drew Applebaum their father and son team who discuss sports, and you'll be able to find out if father always knows best or not. Um, another show on the network here is Joan of Art, and she does a podcast um, that investigates and celebrates people who like to make art. Um, so go ahead and check out her show. 
Uh, I do want to highlight a couple of shows we just did recently here on Alzheimer Speaks. One is uh, the NFL and brain injuries. What a fascinating conversation we had. Uh, another was spiritual care for those with dementia. And then we also had on uh, Gary LeBlanc and Lisa Rodriguez on healthcare settings and um, be- dementia behaviors and how they are helping uh, clinics and hospitals deal um, better with those situations. We just had our live dementia chats this morning. We had a great conversation about how important their routines and their ability to um, to adapt to their surroundings is. The And that will be posted uh, live here probably tomorrow with my schedule. Um, but the one we did on the 14th was talking about advocating through film. And so that might be of interest, too, with this documentary that we were just talking about. Our next Dementia Chats uh, will be July 12th um, at 11 Eastern, 10 Central, 9 a.m. Mountain, 8 a.m. Pacific, and 4 p.m. London time. We also did a um, video interview on our Conscious Caring uh, Resource Network with Claire Webster of Canada, and she's the founder of Caregiver Crossroads, and she had Just some wonderful information to share with us. Um, If you're going to be in Iowa, August 10th, come and see me at uh, 6.30 p.m. at the uh, Northeast Iowa Community College and uh, Mind Frames Theater. You can uh, see the film His Neighbor Phil. We're also doing a conference, so um, you can go to the blog or just go to my website and find the information there. And then just a couple of blogs I want to um, point out to you. There was one uh, written by um, Elon Caspi, who is a behavioral specialist for dementia. And he has an article about 20 reasons why it's important to gather life history for a person living with dementia. There was also um, an article, uh, just some brief information on a man in Roseville who happened to be um, one of our members' husbands from our memory cafe who went missing. He took the family car, had not driven for, um, what did she say, five to eight years, and they ended up finding him going the wrong way on a highway eight hours later. Pretty scary stuff, but there's some great resources. Um, You just never know when things like this are going to happen. In the meantime, have a great week, and um, our next show will be Thursday afternoon at one o'clock. Central Time with Brian LeBlanc, who is diagnosed with dementia. Thank you so much. Bye now. Hi, I'm Lori LeBay, and I wanted to tell you about Alzheimer Speaks, which is another great podcast. You see, my own mother lived with dementia for 30 years, and I felt lost. Did you know every three seconds someone in the world is being diagnosed with dementia? Odds are it's going to hit your families too. We want to help you connect to services, products, tools, research, and stories so you can be prepared. Please subscribe to Alzheimer Speaks on your favorite podcast platform.